Let me back up then to uh, how I viewed the orbiter over time. Uh, the first launch was 1981, and I was a junior in high school. I wanted to be an astronaut ever since I was five years old. So as soon as I saw that first shuttle launch, uh, my thoughts were, that's my ride. I'm, I'm going up on that thing. Um, uh, and the next thoughts of it was, uh, everybody has that moment in time where you know exactly where you were and when something happened. And I remember Challenger uh, being on the steps of Drexel, uh, and uh, a classmate of mine in his portable radio telling me that the, the shuttle um, exploded. Um, so that's ingrained in my memory, you know, and uh, um, I was thinking uh, at that point, I hope they don't end human spaceflight, you know. Um, then I came here to Goddard uh, as, uh, as an engineer, and I viewed the, the shuttle as uh, Waiting at my payload in space, so you you get to see the um, payload bay, and uh, we loaded some tools in, and you get in the cherry picker and go around and, and look at it. And then I also got to go into the mid deck. Didn't get to go to the flight deck yet, but we had to pack the tools in the mid deck, and that's kind of pristine, you know, on the mid deck because uh, it's nice white paint and everything. So you know, it's like, well, this is my connection, and I'm, I'm still viewing it though as a machine to get my stuff in space, my payload. Uh, like a rocket, and it's actually, you know, uh, the orbiter and everything is three vehicles in one. It's not only that rocket to get your payload to space, it becomes a spacecraft, and then we turn it into a glider for a landing here, and it's very, you know, complex machinery once you get to learn about it. Um, once my equipment flew and I was on the Hubble servicing mission, you know, you get to know the crew. And so you're watching the launch. I mean, I watched launches before um, when I was down the Cape supporting, and I didn't really know anybody on the uh, on the crew. But once you know the crew, you're like, my colleagues and friends are in there, you know. And it takes on yet another perspective of that. Um, and then I remember getting selected and going down to Houston, and uh, I go into the simulators, and the simulators have all these uh, big gray switches and gray paint that's all scraped up, and you're thinking, oh wow, these are pretty beat up. Then I got the flight deck for the first time, and there's big gray switches and scraped paint, and I'm like, wow, this is just like the simulator, you know? And uh, it, it's, it's got a lot of miles on it, you know? And so, uh, um, then I remember uh, during uh, Terminal Countdown, TCDT, where you go uh, for your two weeks before flight and you have your dress rehearsal. And, uh, you know, the way they do your training is you do things over and over, like you forget sometimes whether it really happened or happened in a simulator. So I remember for TCDT coming out of the crew quarters and um, I, I thought there'd be like, couple people there and, and uh, you know, we'd walk out to the orbiter and go through the paces. Well, there's the IMAX camera, the uh, SWAT team, the helicopters flying, and it was like, whoa, you know, this is like, like flight day, you know, so they take all the surprise out of it. And then I remember walking up and I was at the, um, on the level where you climb in before you climb into the white room and, uh, you know, you, you have your, uh, launch an entry suit on, the orange suits we wear, and, and I'm the last to get in because I'm MS2, uh, the flight engineer. And I remember looking at the outside of the orbiter and just saying, man, this is pretty beat up. You know, you see burn marks on it, and you, you, you see scrape marks on the windows, and you're like, man, this is taking me to space and, and getting me home. I'm like, you know, I'm looking down, and I'm like, this is pretty beat up. And I'm like, <laughs> and so, uh, I, I remember uh, uh, then before our launch, uh, we have the uh, astronaut beach house where we get to our, see our family for the, uh, the, the last time. Uh, a few family members, they have to get physicals and come and meet you. And after that, um, uh, I ended up getting, you know, I had a stomach ache. I was going back to crew quarters and, um, uh, you know, my commander Wex was like, well, you, you have, uh, you know, the, the jitters, or, you know, and I'm like, geez, I, I haven't had that since I had a Kiss Mary Cummings in the fifth grade play. And I'm like, I forgot what that felt like, you know, the, the, the jitters and everything. And I said, you know, I'm afraid. I, I want to come home, you know. And, and I gave myself, in my mind, only a 50-50 chance of coming home. Uh, because they give you all the odds of 1 in 23, 1 in 200, uh, you know, 
one in 572, but either you are or you aren't. And, and I, I couldn't comprehend that, so I, I set up 50%. Uh, but I was still willing to do it because I, I was that passionate uh, about space flight. Um, and then the advice Wax gave me, though, was to forget about uh, my family, my friends, and just focus on the mission, just like they trained us to do. And it, and it took about, uh, you know, 18 hours, and, and you live in the moment. Uh, you know, you, you can only affect the next 10 seconds of your life, and you've been training for, uh, we were training for about nine months, and, uh, uh, you know, whatever I was doing, whether I was tying my shoe, or watching a movie, or getting a weather brief, it's only the next 10 seconds in focus, and pretty much then, you know, I focused on the moment, and it's amazing, your, your peripheral vision from training opens up, but when you're totally focused like that, where you're been training with a crew and reading each other's minds, almost, of, of what you're doing, it's, it's a, you're at the height of training, it's, it's amazing. The colors seem more vivid, uh, you can see things out of the corner of your eye, and um, I remember launching, people said, well, what did it feel like launching? And I was like... The only thing I remember is 102, 102, auto, auto, LVLH, good digitals. Uh, <laughs> forced around, you know, first a boundary mode, you know, and going through my checklist because you're so in tune to do that, you know, training, you know, the simulators, you, you're kind of doing the, the launch and, you know, you kind of wander and I kind of got to go to Home Depot. Like, oh, you know, and then, uh, they train that on you where you're just on the moment. In fact, I was in, in orbit and, um, uh, uh, Vegas, our pilot, had to remind me, he's like, uh, you know, the Ohms 1 burn, you know, is, we don't need it, Ohms 2 can wait, we got 45 minutes, he goes, boom, we're in space, get out and look out the window. I'm like, oh, okay. So I remember seeing the Alps, uh, the Italian Alps, so that was about nine minutes into flight, uh, being over the Alps, and it was noon because we launched at sunrise, so it was just amazing to, to see, uh, see it from that perspective. Um, and then working aboard it and, and on the, the station was just amazing. It was, uh, and then going outside and, and actually uh, being able to use my own power tools, that was pretty cool. Uh, that was developed here at Goddard and, and it worked. And <laughs> it didn't break down while I was using it. Um, so, and then the, the landing here, it's, uh, uh, you know, again, you're, you're transforming this into a, uh, you've, you've ridden on a rocket for eight minutes and that's a very, you train most of your time on that. And, um, uh, but it's a short period, it's eight and a half minutes, then you turn it into an orbiting vehicle. And inside, a lot of the switches are marked for different reasons, and you just have to know that your accelerometer switch does something different in orbit and does something different in landing. Um, because all the 3,500 switches uh, in it have multiple purposes depending on which regime of flight you're in. So they all might be marked wrong. Um, so, um, so then you live in this, uh, this vehicle and, um, you know, there's, there's always noise, always light. It's, um, people said, you know, did you look at stars? And I couldn't see any stars. It's all black because, you know, uh, coming from Earth and, and being on the station and even when you were doing an EBA, you know, your eyes are dilated. You've got to really get dark. So it, the, you're floating around and it's really the blackness of space, like the absence of light. It's, it's pretty uh, unique to look at that. So then we're, we're ready to come home and you have to turn it into a, uh, a glider. Um, and as it comes down to the moment you see it here, it, uh, it, it, you slowly transform it to a glider. You slow down and that's actually when you go your fastest, Mach 25, somewhere over Australia. Um, and then you're just maintaining your energy all the way down and because uh, uh, you only got one chance to land. Um, and it's like riding a roller coaster, though. It's not a pretty smooth ride. It's like riding a roller coaster for 45 minutes. Um, things are shaking and bumping, and you know, and uh, you're used to you know being in zero g, and, and slowly the gravity field comes in, and, and some of the books you had, and I remember we had these things called the VW bags, which were these bags that went over the back of the seat. We were supposed to put them away. Um, because as, um, and they hold our books and we forgot to, but you can see that they were designed just for orbit because as we got closer to Earth, the elastic straps got longer and longer and longer and pulled all the books down to near our feet. Um, and then I remember looking out the uh, side window and I saw some flames and I'm like, uh, Wex, what's the, those flames over there on the pilot side? He's like, I don't know. And that's not what you want to hear from a four-time commander. Uh, uh, 
So you can look in your wrist mirror as you're coming down, and I, I use my wrist mirror because uh, again you're in the launch and entry suit, you have your helmet on, and I remember looking above the the, um, the windows, and and you can see it's it's like the, the the flames are around the side, and you're actually turning the atmosphere into a plasma. So you know we usually tell kids you're rubbing friction, but it's not all that energy you see in a launch, uh, which is spectacular, is all now. Uh, uh, potential energy and you've got to take that out into kinetic energy and so when you're coming in you're actually compressing the atmosphere into a plasma that surrounds the vehicle um, and uh, you can look in the wrist mirror and over the overhead windows and I would see like white plasma come up and then percolate like a coffee pot you know and then like these, these rings like in circles and that was like amazing to watch that and then uh, when I landed later they said that was probably about since it was white plasma probably about 9,000 degrees and again, I'm like, this thing, you know, brings you home safely, you know. Um, and um, the, the next perspective I have of it uh, was when I was done flying and it, it didn't bring my friends home safely. Um, and I still um, thought, I hope they don't cancel human spaceflight. Uh, I was mad, I was, I was pretty mad. Um, but. Um, it's a wonderful machine, and we sign up and we take that risk. Um, so it's, um, you know, now looking at it, it's kind of bittersweet to see two of my classmates and uh, Fergie, who uh, uh, escorted my family around during my launch, and uh, um, it, it's kind of bittersweet, you know, and I, I really uh, hope that the human spaceflight can continue. Um, in a manner like it did for the shuttle that can inspire a generation. Um, had I not become an astronaut um, and had the opportunity to fly, I still would have been in the space industry. Uh, down here at Goddard working on Hubble, uh, working on other missions, uh, now making weather satellites. Um, and uh, you guys are a testament to that. Um, you don't have to fly to be inspired. I mean, and, and you can do other things. And, and I'm, I'm really hoping that that's what the uh, next chapter in human spaceflight brings is to uh, inspire another generation to take those steps to keep our uh, space industry going and to keep our exploration, our exploration going beyond low Earth orbit, uh, perhaps to the moon and, and beyond. So. Uh, with that, thank you. Uh, as a first time flyer and a first time uh, spacewalker, it, uh, it was just incredible. The uh, views were too breathtaking to describe. And uh, uh, also, uh, the challenging work was uh, very uh, um, inspirational to uh, be able to build a destiny from the outside.